In the early days of roller coasters and amusement rides, the control over the motion of the ride was entirely determined by the operator. This worked well in a time when there was no electronic means to control these rides. In fact, for a while there were rarely any electronic devices on rides at all. But as rides became more complex with more motions and things to monitor, there became a need for some level of automated control. This would put the amusement industry on a track that closely mirrored the manufacturing industry. Both in a factory and on a ride, there were multiple separate electrical devices that needed to be controlled based on what was occurring with other devices. This would bring about the introduction of relay-based control systems. These work by having an electromechanical device known as a relay that turns on and off when presented with an input. For example, a relay can be placed in between a source of current and an electric motor, say one that powers a ride's lift hill. The relay is normally off in this situation, but let's connect an input device. In this example, a button on a control panel. Now, when the button is pressed, that small current from the button activates the relay, allowing the much larger current from the source to reach the motor, turning it on. This, in effect, created a simple set of logic that now has predictable behavior. This could be made much more complex to allow for granular control of rides and their components. Many rides were built using relay logic in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. In fact, some rides still operate using relay logic today. There were a few issues with relay logic that limited its growth. One of the greatest of these was how complex these machines would become after many inputs and outputs were needed, leading to hard to troubleshoot systems that were very difficult to scale. In the late 1960s, a replacement for relay logic systems was developed, the PLC. A PLC, or Programmable Logic Controller, is essentially an ultra-reliable computer that can execute digital logic based on inputs and then set outputs. Not long after the introduction of the PLC, the Safety PLC would be introduced. This was intended for applications where humans may be in the way of machinery being controlled, and it works by featuring more redundancy than a regular PLC, among other features. The growth of the PLC in manufacturing meant it would soon find its way into ride control cabinets. Over the last 40 years, there's been many changes to PLCs, but they all work on the same basic principles. Inputs from sensors, buttons, or other devices are sent into the ride's PLC. The ride's PLC scans the inputs to see what's changed, doing this usually thousands of times per second. Next, the PLC takes the inputs it detects and compares it to the program the PLC has stored. The program works off a system of instructions that converts the inputs the PLC has received into outputs that it should now produce. This program is usually created in Ladder Logic, a visual programming language that has each line of the program executed sequentially. This means that the first section of the program, or rung, is executed first, then the second, and so on. This program tells the PLC what to set its outputs to given the inputs it is receiving. These outputs are then sent to devices connected to the PLC. There are often relays that turn on high voltage power to ride components beyond this. To understand how a PLC controls a ride, we will follow a simple ride cycle to see what all takes place. Please note that this has been heavily simplified from what occurs on a real ride, but will give a good idea of what generally happens. At the start of the ride cycle, our ride unit is in the station. In this position, the ride unit is flagging a set of magnetic proximity sensors in the station. In addition, there is a restraint unlocking contactor that's in the raised position. Both of these are given as inputs to the PLC. With these inputs flagged, the PLC does not produce any outputs. As we get ready to start the ride, the restraint release contactor is lowered and the ride operators press two start buttons inside of the ride station. These two buttons come into the PLC as two inputs. The lack of a restraint release contactor input is also read by the PLC. In this case, this allows the PLC to start its dispatch sequence, opening the brakes in the station and starting the cable lift motor. The ride unit climbs out of the station, passing another proximity sensor that sends an input to the PLC. This input causes the PLC to output that the station brakes should now be set to closed in order to stop the train if it were to disengage with the cable lift. The train is lifted to the highest point, passing a proximity sensor that sends an input to the PLC, which then sends an output that opens the station brakes, turns on the lift motor on the second lift, as well as setting it to the raised position, and opens the brakes by the second lift. The catch car then disengages with the train mechanically. 
At the same time, the PLC sends an output to close the brakes under the catch car, holding it in place while it also sends a signal to stop lift 1. The train falls down the drop through the station area where it then coasts through the layout before entering the area around the second lift. Around when the train engages with the second lift, it passes another proximity sensor that sends an input to the PLC which sends an output to the brakes just before the second lift, setting them to closed. The train is carried up the second lift. We are near the top, it passes another proximity sensor that sends an input to the PLC. The PLC produces an output that closes the brakes in the station, opens the brakes before the second lift, and finally lowers the lift chain and sets the second lift motor to off. This sends the train flying down the second drop and through the layout once again. It slides through the closed station brakes, flagging proximity sensors that send inputs to the PLC, allowing the exact location of the train in the station to be determined. This data is then used to precisely park the train in the station, using the same input and output method we have been discussing. This is the reason you frequently see more sensors in ride station areas or other areas the train needs to stop at. Throughout this whole process of inputs and outputs, the PLC is also monitoring other sensors for inputs. For example, on our ride there is a light curtain. Think of this as a laser light beam that, if broken, say by a person stepping into its path, it will send an input. In our ride's case, this will trigger a jump in the logic to an emergency stop circuit within the ride's logic. And as long as the train is not parked in the station, this rung of logic will stop all motors and close all brakes bringing the ride to a stop as quickly and safely as possible. There are many more features and more complex logic that can be found in modern rides, but this serves as an overview for how PLCs work and how ride control logic acts as a brain for the ride. In the simplest of terms, a ride's input can be described as the ride's senses, detecting what is happening around the ride. The ride's PLC is then the brain, which based on pre-programmed logic decides what to do after seeing things within the inputs. The ride's outputs are its muscles, actually performing the tasks needed to control the ride. All of these systems working together and with built-in redundancy keep rides safe, reliable, and fun. These basic concepts can be expanded on to explain the most complex rides that exist today. Thanks for watching this video, I hope you learned something or at least enjoyed it. As always, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.